This is part one of the lecture to accompany chapter 16 in your textbook. I highly recommend you read chapter 16 to help you more fully understand the information in this lecture. You may find helpful information in the textbook that I simply don't have time to address. You can pause, stop, and replay this lecture as many times as you wish. Okay, let's begin. Remember that the two general purposes of speech as we do in this class are to inform and to persuade. Up to this point, your speeches have been informative. That is, you have served as a teacher or educator. Your main purpose for speaking has been to provide knowledge and understanding about a particular topic. You did not have an agenda. In other words, you did not ask anything from the audience. You simply wanted to give them information. What they did with that information was up to them. Now your speeches will have a different general purpose. You will be attempting to persuade your audience. By persuasion, I mean that you now have an agenda. You want something from your audience. That something could be that you want them to agree with your stand on a topic. Or it could even be that you want them to actually do something about the topic. Persuasion could be creating a belief or an opinion where no belief or opinion existed previously. It could be changing the opinion or attitude the audience has about a topic, or you could actually try to motivate the audience to take an action they have not taken before. Think about advertisers. The whole reason for most commercials is to motivate you to buy something. That's persuasion. Because persuasion is so potentially powerful, ethics plays a big part when putting together a persuasive speech. There's some good speakers whose motives are not particularly ethical. For instance, someone might be a really good telephone salesman, but if they are using those skills to talk elderly people into giving them their bank account information so that they can steal their life savings, they are not using their powers for good. You want to have the best interests of your audience in mind, and you should use the ethical methods we talked about before. Make sure that you have thoroughly studied the topic from all sides, not just the one you think is correct. Your job is to get your facts straight so you don't mislead the audience. You want to be honest in what you say. Don't do things like quoting out of context, not telling the whole story, misrepresenting your sources. Present your evidence fairly and accurately. Keep in mind also the incredible power of language. Use it responsibly. Don't attempt to manipulate or coerce your audience. Persuasion is a psychological process. It often deals with people's deeply held beliefs, attitudes, and opinions. In diverse audiences such as ours, no matter what the topic your speech is about, you're going to find people with many different opinions about it. Of course, the ideal situation would be that you give such a great speech that you convince everyone. Unfortunately, no matter how skilled you are and how wonderful your speech is, there are always going to be some people who are so committed to their own way of thinking that they can't be persuaded. Uh, these people are known as hostile audience members. They're not necessarily hostile in the sense that they want to hurt you, they just don't agree with you. There will also likely be people who are already on your side. They are your sympathetic audience. Then there are those who fall into the neutral category. They might simply be uninformed, never really knowing much about the topic. They could be undecided and have heard about the topic but not yet formed an opinion. Or they could simply be apathetic and think the subject really doesn't matter to them. It's a good idea to assume that you have some of each of these types of people in your audience. We are a diverse audience after all. And every audience member is important. You can't just ignore them. So how do you adapt your speech to reach all your audience members? Well, it depends on which kind of audience member you're talking about. For hostile audience members, make sure that you have found the best, most factual information that supports your thesis. Also, make sure that you study the opposing viewpoints so that you know the arguments that your audience members who are hostile hold. Be respectful of differing opinions. 
ask them to listen to you with an open mind. Your credibility is key here. So if you appear to have their best interests in mind, even if they don't start out believing you, they may be convinced to at least put their opinion aside while they listen to your side of the story. For sympathetic audiences, the people who are in favor of your thesis, you might think you don't need to do anything for them because they're already on your side, but that's not the case. You really do need to keep them there. So how do you do that? Well, you find new and interesting information, new examples, stories they haven't heard of, some startling statistics they didn't know about, uh, to keep them interested. And what about those neutral audience members? Well, you might have a really good chance of moving them at least somewhat towards you on this attitude continuum. If you have good information and, and credibility and you give them a reason to care about the topic, make it personal to them. In the end, however, you really need to have realistic goals regarding how persuasive you will be with your audience. When you're processing persuasive messages, if you're a listener, uh, listeners tend to engage in mental give and take with the speaker. They don't just sit there passively and soak in everything that a speaker is saying. And as they listen, they're assessing different things. They're assessing the speaker's credibility. They're assessing the way the speaker delivers the speech the kinds of supporting materials that the speaker uses, the language, all those things. They may uh, mentally argue with the speaker inside their own minds. Effective persuasive speakers regard their speeches as a kind of mental dialogue with the audience. So when they're preparing the speech, they try to put themselves in the place of the audience and imagine how the audience is going to respond. And above all, they try to anticipate audience objections and to answer them in the speech. This ends part one of our lecture. Please close this browser window, go back to Canvas, and click on the link for part two of the lecture.